sermon text this morning is from today's gospel reading. I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The words of our text. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you had not noticed, uh, election season is rolling fast upon us. And while most of us don't probably or probably don't give a flying rip about it because quite frankly it's too far away and thinking about politics now is about like, uh, oh I don't know, Christmas decorations coming out before Thanksgiving. Now it's just way, way too soon. However, there are some issues blowing in the wind that pique our interest and one of them is about the the evils of our economic system. Yes, the evils of capitalism. You know, goes like this. Under capitalism, somebody has more than what you have, and you are entitled to a share of their stuff and a share of their income, or so the argument goes. And we are all told that equality of outcome is the important thing, not equality of opportunity. Well, that type of philosophy is really nothing more than coveting and it's coveting not even wrapped up in a, a pretty wrapping shiny package but sadly all of humanity is broken we all suffer from original sin man will unfortunately always be inhumane to man and the poor will always be with us the good news is that's not the point today but I was thinking about that, and, and one thing that we can notice, okay, uh, is, is that in our system, right, our marketing plans are very clearly based on what you don't have and what you are not. Have you ever noticed that? Advertising, that's what advertisers do. They, they're trying to get you to look at what you don't have and what you aren't, okay? So we get the if only. If only you buy this product, you will be fulfilled. It's probably why teenage boys have loud radios, you know, it's kind of like that. Uh, or if you get the right phone, everybody will like you. You'll be part of the in crowd. You're not pretty enough. You don't drive the right car. But if you have the right car with the right speakers, then you'll certainly need to have the right tires because you probably don't have the right tires on that particular automobile. Or maybe you don't have enough of a retirement account or you don't have the right retirement account. You do not have enough investments. You are definitely not healthy enough and you need this pill or that pill and this cream or that cream and specifically a diet geared right towards you. And if you do that, that will cause you to be noticed and it will give you happiness. Okay, yeah. We all need to take charge of the voices in our lives and not listen to every single one of them, but quite frankly, it's depressing. And if you pay a lot of attention, it gets more and more depressing because there's no way to keep up with advertisers and product sellers and keep up with all the things you're supposed to have or that you need or the things that will eliminate fear from your life, right? And you're supposed to do this and be that and, and, and not to mention all of the things you're supposed to engage in to stay healthy. But I figured out the only way you can do all the things to stay healthy that you need to do to stay healthy is to actually not have a job so you can exercise all the time. It's, it's an impossibility to keep up with what we are supposed to do. And all at the exact same time, your body's going to wear out no matter what. But see, I think all of this can lead us to assume, because all these voices are coming at us and, and the images are coming at us, and all of this can lead us to assume that we don't have a lot of value in this life. There, there's not a lot of value in who or what we are. But in truth, the, the opposite is what's really uh, going on. 
The truth of things is stunningly opposite of the fact that you don't have any value. The fact of the matter is you have an immense amount of value. But the first thing we need to do is back up a bit. And we need to establish the who's and the what's. You know, whose world is this? Well, this is God's world. It's God's world and he created it and that's important. He created the world and the universe and everything that exists and he did it all in six days and when he was done with it, he declared that it was all good. And by the work of his hands, he made humanity as a special creation. The Lord God formed the man out of the dust of the ground and the Lord God breathed the breath of the life into the man's nostrils. And the man became a living creature. And then we are told no suitable helper was found for the man. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on the man. And while he slept, he took out one of his ribs and he closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from man, look, you get this, it's handwork. The Lord God made the woman. You see, you and I, as a race of human beings, were personally created by the Almighty God who created and fashioned the universe. And as human beings, we have a special place in God's creation. As Genesis 1 tells us, then the Lord God said, let us take the man, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth, over everything that creeps and moves along on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You are made in the image and likeness of God. Indeed, you are, in fact, exceptionally special and very much cared for. Even when mankind turned its back on their creator, it is the Father who was merciful to us. Genesis 3.15 gives us the first promise of a Savior. I will put enmity between you and the woman between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall crush your head, and you shall bruise his heel. But God's promises get even more personal than promises delivered to an entire race of people. For we are often apt to think, yes, God loves humanity, but does God love me? Does God love me? The promises of God are specific to you as an individual. Also, for what the psalmist declares, we can too declare. Right? For you formed me, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, O Lord. My soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that you formed for me, as when there were yet none of them. That's how personal God is to you. He formed you in your mother's womb. In the same way, the words spoken to the prophet Jeremiah are words spoken to each of us. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And the words of Psalm 95 apply to you as an individual as we sing them in the order of matins. We sing the Venite, which means, O come, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. The Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. The deep places of the earth are in his hands. The strength of the hills is his. The sea is his, for he made it. His hands formed the dry land. And what is your relationship to that very specific and particular God? He is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. The one true God, our God, is full of glory and majesty. And who are you in relation to him? You are his people. You are the sheep of his hand. You are his valued, valued people, a people made for himself and for his own glory. And what is the glory of God? 
It is the glory of God to save. That is his glory. Jesus speaks in our gospel reading today of a wandering sheep, a valued sheep, a sheep that is loved. And of course, we are to see ourselves in the picture of that sheep that for whatever reason has strayed from the fold. And what do we call that? Of course, we call that sin. When we have strayed from the fold, we all know we have done it. We have all turned our back. It doesn't matter how it happened. Maybe we thought something was better. Let's not worry about that. We know we have all sinned against God. We have wandered away from this great God, from the master of all. And what does God do? God goes out. God seeks the sheep. Not to yell at the sheep, but to find the sheep. To lift up the sheep. To bear the sheep. To carry the sheep. Isaiah 46 says, Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been born by me from before your youth, carried from the womb, even to your old age I am he. And to your gray hairs I will carry you. I have made, I will bear, I will carry, I will save. That's what your God does for you. He cares. He, he bears you up. He carries you. He saves you. To the repentant wandering sheep comes the promise, and this is stunning. I think it's a stunning promise, that the angels rejoice. Right? Jesus, the Son of the living God, says the angels rejoice over one sinner who repents. Now think about that for a moment. The angels in heaven rejoice over you when you are repentant. Where else in the entire Bible do angels rejoice? There are two other places in the Bible. The entire Bible where the angels rejoice. One has recorded us in the book of Job. Right? God relates that at creation the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And St. Luke tells us that when the birth of the Savior came about and was heralded to the shepherds, Suddenly there was an an- with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. At creation, at the birth of the Savior, the angels rejoice. And when you say, God, I'm sorry, the angels rejoice over you and your confession. Now tell me, Tell me you don't have value. Imagine that you don't have value. That the entire heavenly host rejoices over you. You see, the promise of God's redemption has been placed on you and your baptism. Oh yes, we have wandered and we can't deny that, yet we have been carried by the Holy Spirit of God each together this morning to gather here to confess our sins and receive the absolution. And we together as one flock will receive the sacrament of the altar Can you simply imagine then the rejoicing and the joy of the angels right now, this very day? This very day as the angels look into things they cannot comprehend because no Savior was given for the angels who rebelled, only for humanity. Yes, indeed, we are exceptionally special and exceptionally cared for. Only to you, you as an individual, you as a special creation of God. You who have been given the tangible forms of God's promises in the sacrament, water upon your head, bread and wine in your hands and in your mouth. You whom Jesus was born for. You whom Jesus died for. You whom Jesus rose again for. You who Jesus sought out. You who Jesus carries. You who Jesus defends. You are special. So who are you? You are a child of God. That's exactly who you are. And you are bound up with the life of Jesus Christ. And you, my friends, are valuable indeed. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may that peace, which passes all understanding, be in your hearts and minds through the one true faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
You have been sharing in the 8 a.m. worship service at Zion Lutheran Church, 205 Pulaski Street in Lincoln, Illinois, and just heard Rev. Mark Thompson deliver this morning's message. Sunday School for All Ages is at 9.20 a.m. in our education building, followed by our 10.30 a.m. worship service. We invite you to join us in person for a worship fellowship and Bible study. However, if you cannot be physically present, join us every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. over WLLM 1370 a.m. or WLLM 90.1 f.m. or translators at Lincoln and Springfield at 105.3 f.m. or on cable channel 5 or the LCTV app on your smartphone on Saturday and Sunday at 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. and daily at 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Zion's worship services are also available live via the internet at www.zlclinc.org. Zion is a member congregation of the Worldwide Fellowship of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. If you are without a church home, we invite you to become a part of our Zion family. If we may assist you in any way, please call us at 732-3946 or write to us at Zion Lutheran Church, 205 Pulaski Street, Lincoln, Illinois, 62656. Zion also offers a premier education with a Christian worldview for children from age 3 through the 8th grade at Zion Lutheran School. If you would like more information concerning our school, please contact the school office at 732-3977. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.